Check it out. Remember if I can see that? Or what's he from him and Austin? Upon what criterion could citizens agree that it was necessary to go to war? Surely a nation full of citizens with no common values would be confused. They may be totally free, but their confusion will make them short-lived, if not barbaric. And many civilizations prior to the United States were barbaric. That's why the American experiment is so important. That's why the rudiments that made America happen must be preserved. Thus, applying and defending the values implied in the Constitution are, in essence, a matter of survival. For if these factors are dropped out, you get a cruel, chaotic, and revengeful society. Such a society will eventually occupy its time with pleasure-seeking hedonism, material acquisition, and violence-oriented pastimes. Hey, welcome to today's United States. No surprise, the baby boomers are in charge now. The United States has undergone a cultural, moral, and religious revolution. And a militant secularism has arisen in this country. It's always had a hold on the intellectual and academic elites. But in the 1960s, it captured the young in the universities and the colleges. And we had this great battle cultural war begin then nationally. And since then, if you will, secularism has, has really achieved dominance in the academic community and in the intellectual community and in the entertainment community in Hollywood, uh, among part of the, uh, the political community, but not the nation as a whole. However, it is much stronger than it was, and so this is the basis of the great cultural war we're undergoing uh, right now. 
And this militant, it is an anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-traditionalist revolution. It's partly a, the sexual resolute revolution has a lot to do with it and how people live. And so we are two countries now. We are two countries morally and socially and culturally and theologically. And cultural wars do not lend themselves to peaceful coexistence. One side prevails or the other prevails. And the truth is that while the conservatives, in my judgment, we won the Cold War with political and economic communism, we've lost the cultural war with cultural Marxism, which I think has prevailed pretty much in the United States, or is now the dominant culture, whereas those of us who are traditionalists, we are, if you will, the counterculture. What exactly is cultural Marxism, the dominant culture of today? How did the founders of communism figure out a way to take over our country, not with guns and weapons, but with values and ideas? Let's take a closer look at this and see exactly how it happened. There was a man named Karl Marx. Marx got an idea. His idea was that the workers of the world should unite and rise up to counter an evil foe, that foe being capitalism. Capitalism, the idea that people and private companies should be able to own the means of production and be free to earn and have as much as they wished, was anathema to Marx. Marx felt the state should own the means of production, as well as products produced, and then the state should distribute a fair share of all such products to each and every worker. Thus, in his book, The Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx thundered, Workers of the World Unite! Sure that he had a principle to unify all workers in every country, Marx looked forward to eventually taking over the world. Karl Marx believed that you would have a rebellion by the workers uh, against uh, the capitalist system, which would then create uh, a Marxist uh, communist society where you would have dictatorship of the proletariat. Unfortunately, when World War I broke out, the workers of the world did not unite. In fact, the workers united with their respective countries and fought each other. What happened was the Marxists had an enormous disillusionment when the French and the Germans and the British workers all rose up for the fatherland and went to war happily, fighting one another. Marx's idea was a total failure. Workers were more loyal to their respective countries, churches, and cultural values than they were to their counterparts in other countries. They did not want to give up their houses, their cars, their stoves, their products. They did not want to have a classless society. Uh, they did not uh, vote and they didn't even have an overthrow. Some years after Marx failed, several of his disciples got a new idea on how to take over the world. One of his disciples, Antonio Gramsci, while where else but in prison, wrote up a series of plans now known as the prison notebooks. In this plan, Gramsci announced the workers of the world will unite only after the long march is over. The long march? In other words, they had to get into the culture and change the way of people's thinking. And if people were thinking about patriotism and nation and God and country, that was a mechanism which was too resistant to Marxism. It could never take hold. So you had to erode and destroy that in the individuals. That began what's called the long march through the institutions, through the seminaries, through the churches, through the media, through Hollywood, and all the rest of it to create an anti-Christian culture which would destroy the Christian beliefs and convictions in the vast majority of the people so they would embrace the ideas of Marxism and they would embrace the ideas that they had rejected and they would be open to a takeover, basically, by Marxists. Now, not political Marxists, but cultural Marxists. Rather than workers uniting and marching into battle, thus seizing power through force, they would make a long march through the institutions. Institutions like the arts, cinema, theater, literature, schools, college, seminaries, newspapers, magazines, 
and what is now known as radio, TV, and the mass media. Once this march is over, all the barriers to the acceptance of Marxism will have been quietly and systematically removed. So to get to that point, they said we have to destroy the culture, and what they were talking about was the Christian culture, uh, what we used to call Christendom or Western civilization. If you can break people away from religious affinities, for example, where they would turn to their community, their religious community for support and help, or they would turn to scripture for answers to certain perplexing questions. If they have an affinity to their religion, they might say, well, we're not going to go along with government because it's contrary to my religion. So cultural Marxism would attack religion of all kinds. doesn't make any difference because there was another place where people could go other than to the government for support and for answers. We the people will have thus been indoctrinated or brainwashed into seeing the wisdom of Marxism and the folly of capitalism. Thus, the door to socialism and communism will be open and the door to a constitutional republic closed. Because the success of cultural Marxism means the demise of the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution is a set of principles. It's based ultimately on a moral code because you go back to the Declaration of Independence. What was the basis for the Declaration of Independence? The law of nature and of nature's God, right? The ultimate moral code. Uh, but if you don't follow those principles, if you try, as the expression goes, shave a point off here and there uh, to make a buck or to be reelected or for your special interest group to get some kind of a government subsidy, then the consequences are going to be in the long run deleterious to society as a whole. And there's the difficulty. There are too many people that are thinking in the short term and not applying these principles which are designed to give us a long term stability to this system. Let's back up a moment. How did cultural Marxism get into the United States? Some brief history. In 1923, members of the Marxist Communist Party set up an institute at Frankfurt University in Germany. This institute was named the Institute for Social Research. Later, it would become known as simply the Frankfurt School. These new Marxists, under the direction of Max Horkheimer, had seen the old Lenin Marxists fail. The workers of the world did not unite in World War I. Further, they realized why. Antonio Gramsci, the disciple who wrote the prison notebooks, had it right. Marxism could only flourish after a long march through the cultural institutions. Now the mantra would be, change Western culture, and then the workers will unite. After Marx, there were a group of Marxists who wisely decided that you could bring this collectivist society to a nation through culture as well, by introducing certain values and concepts that would break down the family, for example. If you could somehow break down the family unit so that it was no longer self-sustaining and no longer valued in a society, then that would leave individual members who formerly could turn to the family for support in times of need, they would now be cut loose. They would be without a place to go in times of need, so now they have to turn to the government. But just as the march through the institutions was about to begin, an anti-Marxist, anti-Semitic Adolf Hitler ascended to power and World War II began. Since the leading lights of the Frankfurt School were Marxist the school packed up its ideology and fled to America, settling down in New York City with the support of Columbia University. But what exactly is the march? And who was marching? What values has the long march through the institutions rolled over? Let's hear it from some of the Frankfurt School graduates themselves like George Lukacs, Antonio Gramsci, Charles Reich, Herbert Marcuse, or Theodore Adorno, Eric Fromm, Wilhelm Reich, and Max Horkheimer. Marx got it all wrong. 
the workers are not up to being the vanguard of the communist revolution. Let's translate Marxism into cultural terms. And Herbert Marcuse. The West is guilty of genocidal crimes against every civilization and culture it has encountered. America and Western civilization are the world's greatest repositories of racism, sexism, nativism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, fascism, and Nazism. American society is oppressive, evil, and undeserving of loyalty. Have you ever heard of cultural Marxism? If so, what is it? Um, I'm not familiar completely with Marxism. I have not heard of cultural Marxism. Cultural have Marxism. Um, no, I don't even think I know what it, I, that that kind of talk is gibberish to me. I hate <laughs> okay. To tell you. It's used in 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 some terms, I think, as a, sort of a uh, the thing that uh, is almost politically correct from a Marxist from a Marxist standpoint. In other words, from a socialist or communist standpoint. George Lukacs. I see the revolutionary destruction of society as the one and only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without the annihilation of the old values and the creation of the new ones by the revolutionary. Lukacs' gift to America later became known as cultural terrorism. Gifts such as radical sex education in public schools covering such subjects as free love, outdatedness of monogamy, irrelevance of religion, and the archaic nature of the middle-class family. Women were called upon to rebel against the sexual mores of the day, such being the core values of Christianity and Western culture. His ideas later became the basis for the sexual revolution, embraced by a generation of drug-challenged baby boomers. When you hear people say, as I did on the campaigns, Pat, what happened to the country we grew up in? Physically, it's the same country, but they're right. We're in another country now. And this is why I think the cultural Marxists have prevailed and are prevailing. They have captured the young. Uh, what was the saying in the um, Abby Hoffman, we're going to capture your children? In a lot of ways, they did. Although Gromsky died in 1937, his prison notebooks lived on as the blueprints to de-Christianize the West. The civilized world has been thoroughly saturated with Christianity for 2,000 years. Any country grounded in Judeo-Christian values cannot therefore be overthrown until those roots are cut. But to cut the roots, to change culture, a long march through the institutions is necessary. Only then will power fall into our laps like a ripened fruit. And the new generation of freedom-loving, authority-challenged baby boomers were quite willing to accept the bait and take a toke. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Yes, our prison planner, Antonio Gramsci, had quite a dream. The only way a Marxist revolution could be successful was if the heat shield of capitalism, Christianity, were first destroyed. Charles Reich. There is a revolution coming. It will not be like revolutions of the past. It will originate with the individual, with culture, and it will change the political structure only as its final act. Reich thus helped shape the minds of the American 60s youth with his runaway best-selling book, The Greening of America. Gramsci and Marx were now reaching their target audience, and the long march was in progress. In the 1960s, the church pulled back from the culture. You had the first Sex and Satanism film. You had the first X-rated film, where the pastor takes the boy up to his room in Broadway to get on his knees but not to pray. 
Uh, you had uh, all of the perversion. You went from 100% broad audience films that anybody could see uh, to 82% R-rated movies, which were restricted. Uh, you had a tremendous uh, loss of viewership of the movie theaters. Even though television had been around for 20 years, you went from 44 million weekly attendance to 17 million weekly attendance. And so basically what happened, the church gave up in the mid-60s. It came up on prayer in schools. It gave up on being a, a force in society. And Johnson uh, shackled the church uh, when he uh, said that, uh, when he used the 501c3 to say the churches couldn't talk about politics and the church just buckled under. When prayer was taken out of school, the church buckled under. When the church collapsed from Hollywood, uh, they buckled under. So it was the church's internal collapse. And that has happened before in history. And unless people get revival, reformation, renewal, we will never reclaim the culture. So cultural Marxism would be that type of activity in any society that breaks down the culture in such a way so that people instinctively turn to government as an alternative for the support that they otherwise would have. This is done through art, and through music, it's through literature, it's through motion pictures and that kind of thing the implanting of certain ideas and concepts which make them very ripe for the philosophy of collectivism and makes them very ripe for turning to government as the big daddy, the big solver of all problems. As Hudson Institute scholar John Fonte wrote, Max Horkheimer and Gromsky believe that there are no absolute moral standards that are universally true for all human beings outside a particular historical context. In other words, to the Frankfurt School, values come from society or the state collective. Same? Yes. That's relativism. Collectivism implies that if something is important enough, then the state should step in and make sure that everybody conforms, whether they want to or not. So the essence of collectivism in a political sense is that it employs the use of coercion to require people to work together. And once coercion enters, then you are actually participating in a negative social conduct, which is in many cases worse than the uh, social condition that you're trying to overcome by the collective action people are not given free will. They're required to do this and that because uh, the majority has decided this is for the greater good of the greater number and so forth. Whereas individualism uh, works toward the same goals, but they do so in the environment of freedom. So it's the difference between freedom and coercion. Not to be outdone by Karl Marx, a brilliant mind or two at the Frankfurt School soon came up with several of their own ideas, the foremost known as critical theory. The idea behind critical theory is to challenge all previously accepted standards in every aspect of life from a Marxist perspective. Standards such as Abe Lincoln was honest, home is where the heart is, democracy and capitalism are good, the founders believed in freedom. In doing this, every negative thing one could possibly say about America was dredged up, circulated in books, movies, TV, schools, colleges, and even the clergy, so that the youth would be endlessly indoctrinated. Things like white men killed the Indians, fathers were repressive, God is dead, the founders had slaves, they did have a problem, which was that although slavery was technically legal throughout all the colonies, only some of the colonies really had slave-based economies, the southern states, Maryland, south, essentially. And therefore, they had to deal with the practical problem of how could you integrate these states with the northern and middle colonies, middle states and northern states, in a way that would, as much as possible, unify them. So they had to make some kind of initial political compromises with the social institutions that existed in the southern states. But there was a mindset at the time that slavery would essentially wither away because it was not a practical economic concern in the long run. But it certainly was not a matter that could be criticized from the point of view of, of principle. Uh, 
You know, the first principle in the preamble is to create a more perfect union. That was their first goal. But when the consciousness challenged baby boomers repeatedly heard that the establishment, as they came to refer to it, was a bunch of racist, overly religious, sexually deprived sexists who were xenophobic Indian killers and anti-Semites, they internalized the criticisms. Soon their movies and songs began to reflect these values, spreading them throughout the nation's youth culture. Critical theory was doing its job, especially on people like Charles Manson and John Lennon. Even though the reality-challenged baby boomers of the 1960s were the most free, most affluent, and most privileged of any youth in any age, they were bored with their lives and swallowed the Frankfurt School's propaganda like a hit of California sunshine. Books like The Death of the Family, Escape from Freedom, The Mass Psychology of Fascism, The Sexual Revolution, The Joy of Sex, and The Authoritarian Personality flew off the shelves. Counterculture drug movies like The Trip, Easy Rider, The Wild Angels, The Wild Bunch, and Born Loser played theaters endlessly. Books like Authoritarian Personality were particular hits because they attacked the patriarchal family unit, a deeply Christian institution. So along came movies depicting the family unit as sexually repressed and dysfunctional. Movies like Battle of the Sexes, How to Handle Your Wife, Harold and Maude, The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, Carnal Knowledge, Bob and Ted and Carol and Alice, Boys in the Band, The Godfather, and Kramer vs. Kramer instilled cultural pessimism about families. Uh, the basic unit of a family is where a male uh, as a sex uh, joins with a female as a sex and they're able to work together to help each other and by being able to work together to help each other they perfect each other they love each other they care for each other and in the process they learn to love and perfect and care for others within the society they become good citizens because they're good citizens within their own home and that produces a society that loves each other. It's, marriage is a particularly Judeo-Christian institution. It, it was Jesus who instituted uh, one man and one wife uh, forever shall become one flesh. By targeting the family unit, the cultural Marxists knew they could eventually destroy the middle class of the United States. Why? Because the family unit is the basic building block of the middle class destroy the middle class, and you eventually destroy the economic engine of the United States. Destroy the economic engine of the U.S. and its political structure, built on capitalism and the Constitution, crumbles. Uh, I just recently um, had, had some shares stolen from me on the stock market by our government, who, who seized 80 percent of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac shares. I'm like, how, how could this happen? And they, they seized, um, you know, private property. The whole point of a socialistic society is to do four things. Marx talks about destroying the family, two, destroying property, three, destroying religion, and four, destroying the nation. And what you end up with is the gulag, where the whole country becomes the Soviet Union. Yes, critical theory is diabolical genius. The cultural Marxist could accomplish what Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin only dreamed of accomplishing. Whereas Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin took Marx's ideas and delivered the brutal Soviet Union to the world, Gramsci, Lukacs, and Marcuse took Marx's ideas and delivered user-friendly cultural Marxism to America. The Supreme Court has been converted into a fighting ally of secularism in the wars against traditionalism in the United States. The Supreme Court has perverted the Constitution. It has usurped power that belongs to the states and imposed secular views and values on the states and on the communities, making decisions that used to be made democratically at the local level. This time, it seems, Marx won. Today, 
post-angle, politically correct baby boomers are so completely immersed in the Frankfurt School's cultural pessimism, they can't see the forest for the trees. They're fish in a bowl of muddy water. They're Neo in the Matrix. They swim in it. They absorb it through every pore of their beingness. Starting in the 1960s, cultural Marxism has woven its values into every American's very existence. Khrushchev was right when he said, we will bury you. To understand what socialism is, one must first understand what communism is. Communism is an economic system whereby the state owns the means of production. Means of production meaning capital. Capital meaning money, machinery, labor, land, and resources. Socialism is an economic system whereby the state owns the fruits of production. Fruits of production meaning revenues generated by the means. Revenues generated by the means is another way of saying taxes. Extreme of socialism was uh, the Soviet system, communism. So there was no pricing structure and it's a failed system, it can't work because prices are so important. So communism owns and confiscates the means and fruits of production. Whereas socialism confiscates just the fruits of production in the form of excessive taxes. Socialist states in Europe, for instance, confiscate as much as 50% of the money citizens pay for retail products and services. This is the outrageous sales tax a socialist state demands. We interfere a lot, but we allow prices to adjust in the marketplace for the most part. But when it comes to interest rates, the Federal Reserve is always deciding the central plans through the control of money and interest rates, how much money we should have in circulation and should we shrink the money supply, expand the money supply. And that's a form of socialism, but it's only half of socialism because it's controlling only half of the transaction and that's money. But it's, it's very dangerous and leads to an authoritarian approach because it eventually breaks down and I think that's what we're witnessing today. Thus, a socialist state rapes the people mainly through excessive taxes. A fascist state rapes the people mainly through excessive debt. Both ultimately rape the people through taxes because debt causes inflation, a hidden tax. Debt causes inflation because the Federal Reserve System facilitates the conversion of government bonds government IOUs into Federal Reserve notes, what we use as a currency. Well, the Federal Reserve in its very nature is contrary to a free market. The Federal Reserve is not only regulating, but it's manipulating the marketplace against the will of uh, the people who are conducting the marketplace. When this is done, the money supply is inflated. When the money supply is inflated, it becomes watered down or diluted. Just like stock, when a corporation authorizes and issues more stock, existing shareholders are diluted. When money is diluted, it has less purchasing power. When it has less purchasing power, prices rise because it takes more Federal Reserve notes to purchase a given product. When prices rise, it has the effect of a tax. Inflation is therefore a hidden tax. If the government can create new money that it doesn't have to tax for, and especially if it can put off the ultimate payment of this into the future through the use of long-term bonds that are the back backing for the fiat currency, then we have a government that is essentially uh, out of control to some degree. It can make decisions that are not immediately going to subject the people to pressure. Unfortunately, the constitutional republic envisioned by the founders is being undermined by cultural Marxism and destroying the republic envisioned by the founders.
As we have seen, the Constitution gives Congress the power and the responsibility to provide for the general welfare of the nation. So important is the idea of general welfare, this is the only term that is stated twice in the Constitution, once in the preamble and again in Article I. Unfortunately, a lot of people interpret this term to be a green light for massive social security, the so-called nanny state, which pays for everything and then demands the right to regulate everything. Well, the Constitution was written to limit the size and scope of government. It was to uh, recognize that government was there to protect our liberties. It does not endorse the welfare system at all. If we just followed the Constitution, the government would be very much smaller, maybe 80% smaller. This may be the cultural Marxist's dream of a socialist state, but as a result, we now have minimum wage laws, child labor laws, federal disability laws, Medicaid laws, public housing laws, rent laws, entitlement laws, food stamp laws, and even extensive pet laws. Over 25,000 laws are enacted every year, many by congressmen that have been bought and paid for by multinational corporations, all non-people entities. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. If you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code, no matter what your purpose is. What comes to mind is big corporations that put their view of the world out there for everyone, um, take over small businesses, take over um, choices that people might have, different kinds of products where everything becomes much more generic and just based on cost as opposed to quality and workmanship. Because term limits have not been established for the Congress, most congressmen have been able to stay in office for decades. Again, this is the Supreme Court. States were enacting and imposed term limits on their members of Congress uh, in something like half the American states, and the Supreme Court overthrew it and took the right away from the states to impose term limits on their own members of Congress. And what did Congress do? They said, that's fine with us, because we'll stay in power. It seems the more a congressman is entrenched, the more he is able to build a social network, a network of cronies. Clearly, good relationships with fellow congressmen serve many productive purposes, but such a network can also be abused. After all, it's much easier to minimize the risks of vote swapping, a form of collusion, amongst cronies. It's much easier to justify corporate campaign contributions, a form of bribery, amongst cronies. And it's much easier to get away with earmarks, a form of fraud, amongst cronies. Thus, an entrenched Congress, especially one cast into only two major political parties, would seem to be in the perfect position to imperceptibly usurp power from the people and place it into the hands of the corporate fascists that have hijacked Congress. The right place to look for a solution to the problem of corrupt politicians is at the voter and their perception of who they're voting for and what the political principles of their candidates are. You can bet collusion, bribery, and fraud are not practices the founders envisioned for a more perfect union. So unless I have this view that I need to participate in this system as a self-governing citizen to maintain the integrity of the system, the system will eventually be dominated from the top down by the people who can actually make something from gaming it, as the expression goes. So it, I, this is the Founding Fathers' point. It depends upon having a virtuous citizenry that is willing to shoulder the burdens of maintaining a self-governmental structure. Again, general welfare includes everyone, especially the vast majority of average citizens who fall within the middle of the social spectrum. 
In statistical terms, the average, or mean, is represented at the top, or crest, of what's known as a bell-shaped curve. It's the middle of the bell-shaped curve. So it's fair to say that the original intent of the Constitution is to define a government that serves the general population, the middle of the bell-shaped curve, now known as the middle class. Do you sense a dwindling middle class or a wealth disparity? Well, I think things are changing right now. I think the last, uh, the last eight years have been uh, uh, increasing, increasing wealth disparity, but I think some of the excesses of those days uh, may be over. The terms spreading the wealth, redistribution, and wealth disparity are meaningless in an America that truly responds to the original intent of the Constitution. The proper function of government is not to provide, but to protect. Because if you're going to provide for some, you must have the authority and the power to take from others. And once you're in that business of taking from some and giving to others, now you're in the business of redividing the wealth. And that gives you tremendous power over, over the citizenry. And it always leads to abuse of power and eventually to totalitarian regimes. Many have commented that we now have a monstrous tax system, a system that taxes its citizens far more than citizens of the Boston Tea Party era. If two to three percent taxation justified a revolution in 1776, why doesn't 50 percent and growing justify a revolution? If a few little excise taxes on pieces of paper and tea justified open lawlessness from these rebels that we're all celebrating, why don't the myriad of incomprehensible, unavoidable, crushing taxes, state, local, and federal, why don't they justify a revolution today? Our government not only taxes us at every transaction, it's in our faces at every turn, endlessly regulating what we can and cannot do. All these regulating laws and their expensive enforcement programs are turning us into a police state. policemen of the world. So instead of a government now that uh, occupies so many other countries and we have 700 bases overseas, that wouldn't happen if we had the proper size government. Over 50 percent of U.S. citizens now work for the government at either the federal, state, or local level. The nefarious genius of cultural Marxist strategy is to destroy the family unit by promoting what's known in the field of botany as androgyny. From the American College Dictionary, androgyny means, quote, having staminate and pistolate flowers in the same inflorescence, being both male and female, hermaphroditic, end quote. Translated into cultural Marxist strategy, this means making the father and mother of a family the same and or reversing their roles. How is this done? Well, it starts with invalidation. 
I hate this house and I don't want to be here anymore. As previously discussed, one of the key technologies of the Frankfurt School is critical theory. Recall the purpose of critical theory is to instill cultural pessimism. Thus, by endlessly portraying fathers as dominant, restrictive, depersonalized, and controlling, the cultural Marxist is able to invalidate the male component of the family unit. Concomitant with this, by endlessly portraying mothers as schizophrenic, nagging, anxious, the cultural Marxist is able to invalidate the female component of the family unit. This two-punch invalidation, endlessly repeated in the general literature, movies, and media, gives rise to a pessimistic attitude towards the traditional family. After time, this pessimism becomes imbued into the culture. That's why it's said the product of critical theory is cultural pessimism. The message of cultural pessimism. One, families are boring, stifling, and intrusive. Two, mothers and fathers suck. Three, divorce is therefore understandable and justified. With divorce made understandable and justified, even laughingly made easy by calling it no fault, one out of two nuclear families now disintegrate into chaos. Most contracts, the court system tries to sustain the contract. If you and I are doing business together and uh, they are trying to protect that contract because the contract was entered into in good faith for good principles. However, although the marriage might have been entered into in good faith, by breaking that, they can put a lot of people to work. Not only the, uh, the marital courts can go to work, they're also the social workers that go to work. There's also a whole team of people, including the IRS, who prey off of them. And one court in Massachusetts says, we're going to bring this father to his knees and take all of his money from him. So there's a whole movement by the courts to make money off the dissolution of marriage. After the mother and the father are finally done arguing or negotiating over custody of the children and possession of the assets, two new family homes are usually established. He lives here and she lives there. Each new household economy now has to have a redundant, otherwise superfluous set of rent or mortgage payments energy and utility demands, and household furnishings and accoutrements. Extensive and complex scheduling of child visitation then must be established. If the divorce was acrimonious and or the children were traumatized by it, and most are, both parents vie for the children's attention and visitation. As they do this, knowingly or unknowingly, they spoil the children with unending material gifts, junk food, sugar, unearned validation, and parental supervision so lenient it borders on gross negligence. Divorce is a dreadful for children. And now you have uh, some families, probably the weakest and the, and the poorest, mostly black families that are now over uh, 50 and even 60% in divorce, which is critical uh, for the children. But worst of all, children are usually shipped off to daycare centers and or public schools where they are then handled like animals in captivity. Now we're talking about a, a school system that's teaching values that's determined not by the, by the parents, not even by the teachers, but by the political uh, groups that provide the funding, the politicians, the bureaucrats, the, the uh, think tanks, all the these invisible uh, structures above. Now, those are the people who are determining the values that are being taught in our schools. The profligate cultural Marxist society that causes and tolerates this then imposes pharmaceutical drugs on these children. Certainly the arts have always had a tendency uh, to promote license instead of liberty. The difference between license means that I can do anything, if it's, even if it's destructive uh, of other people and, and of myself. I can take drugs until I OD. I can uh, hurt other people uh, and hurt their children and families. 
Uh, license is something that is selfishness rules. With liberty, what rules is the freedom to be responsible, the freedom to live a decent life, the freedom to love others, the freedom to give. It's like the difference between love and lust. And unfortunately, often the principle of love is replaced in the media with the principle of lust. And the lust principle produces media that's constantly uh, pushing the envelope. Almost every movie that Hollywood puts out today must depict characters with at least one of the following attributes. One, the protagonist and or the antagonist are divorced. Two, the female is portrayed as dominant, controlling, violent, and or one up on men. Three, the male is portrayed as aloof, feminine, overly sensitive, and or cheating. Four, somewhere in the family, at least one of its immediate members must be a lesbian, gay, bisexual, or a women's liver. Often, attributes are mixed in various proportions, and even mixed with a touch of schizophrenia, as males and females swap roles in fluorescence. Same-sex marriage does not give you the balance of having a mother and a father so that you can learn different skills from them and you learn different personality types from them. By abolishing that, children are adrift. Through endless repetition and media dissemination, androgynous elements are institutionalized as legitimate and eventually normal. Cultural pessimism has been taken to a whole new level. Complete tolerance for dysfunctional social structures and inefficient economic units. Proof that Christian values do not work. Schools should be completely operated uh, by parents. They should be in control and therefore the parents can determine what values are taught to the students. If the, if the school doesn't teach the values that that parent wants taught to their children, then they can take the child out of that school and put him in another school which does teach those values. The Supreme Court has been converted into a fighting ally of secularism in the wars against traditionalism in the United States. With the success of cultural Marxism, hundreds of millions of nuclear families have been destroyed since 1965. This has contributed to, or caused, the decline of the middle class. Next will be the destruction of American capitalism, unless the effects of cultural Marxism are recognized and handled. There is a revolution coming. It will not be like revolutions of the past. It will originate with the individual and with culture and it will change the political structure only as its final act. Before the Romans crashed and burned, they had gone down the same road, only they called their social security bread and circuses. Bread and circuses will eventually crash the U.S. empire as well, if we interpret the term general welfare in the Constitution as an invitation for social security. General is the problem. What did the Founding Fathers intend when they wrote those words? General welfare has been debated since the Constitution itself. Uh, many of the Founders were concerned that the general welfare would be taken in the wrong sense that it would be used to apply for, as we've done it today, as Hamilton wanted us to do it, to give the government license to do whatever it wanted and just to grab power. The founders knew that Rome and every society since the beginning of time had poor, sick, and unfortunates, and many of these societies tried to help. For instance, in 1597, England had the Elizabethan Poor Laws enacted to provide what were known as the Seven Corporeal Works of Mercy. These works were to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, attend the sick, visit the prisoner, and bury the dead. But is this how you really promote the general welfare, the founders asked? 
You're talking to someone about a free society, and they say to you, as they always do, what about the poor? Oh, the poor? What are we going to do about the poor if there's no welfare state? The poor that die in the streets and isn't that, right? A perfectly valid objection, and we all generally have this tendency, what do we do? We, we run out and we research and we go, we become the human Wikipedia talking point planet of infinite facts and we try and give everybody statistics and we give everybody historical examples and we say, well, these friendly societies in the 1920s and uh, the fact that I find useful is uh, the number of poor people that after the Second World War was declining 1% a year because of the free market when the welfare state came in, it stopped declining and stayed steady, which is exactly what you would expect. If you subsidize something, you increase its prevalence, and you subsidize poverty, you get more. Give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, and you feed him for life. The founders were teachers. Their original intent was to set up a system that created fishermen. The Constitution means what, means what the founders intended it to mean. Otherwise, it means nothing. If, if, you, if you want to have the Constitution mean what modern politicians think it should mean, then you don't need a Constitution. In fact, you're better off without one. Just say, what do the modern politicians want us to do today? What would happen if you created a society that could actually rise above problems? A society where the government gently facilitated a free and prosperous citizenry. A citizenry so successful, there were no hungry. There were no sick or poor. There were no criminals. You could take the Department of Education, the Department of Housing, and any number of these national departments and defund them to zero and send out the funds to the states and block grants, which would eventually go down to zero, and get rid of most of the federal government. The federal government still has a responsibility of national defense. The Justice Department's needed, the State Department's needed, the Treasury Department are needed, but many of those other departments should be defunded rather than have the politics of the federal government imposed upon the nation. The founders wanted to set people free from the system, or the matrix. That's what liberty is all about. They wanted general welfare to be the result of a self-governing, productive society. They wanted general welfare, not welfare in general. Today, the U.S. currency is backed by nothing but debt in the form of U.S. bonds. This is known as monetizing debt, the act of converting debt into money. Debt causes inflation because the Federal Reserve System facilitates the conversion of government bonds, government IOUs, into Federal Reserve notes, what we use as a currency. When this is done, the money supply is inflated. When the money supply is inflated, it becomes watered down or diluted. Just like stock, when a corporation authorizes and issues more stock, existing shareholders are diluted. When money is diluted, it has less purchasing power. When it has less purchasing power, prices rise because it takes more Federal Reserve notes to purchase a given product. When prices rise, it has the effect of a tax. Inflation is therefore a hidden tax. If you can delay the payment and hide the payment, that is, borrow money or print money, uh, those who really pay the price are hard to find. They're usually the poor people in the middle class. So it's, it's a very uh, specific plan to have a central bank to destroy money. It's been done for thousands of years. They used to dilute the metals or clip the coins, or uh, even in the old days they tried printing money. Today we do it with a computer. Thus, cultural Marxism uses debt, which generates the hidden tax of inflation, and endless taxes to fund its socialist operations and expansion. As far as fractional reserve banking is concerned, that's a problem of fraud. That is, fractional reserve banking is where 
the bank generates more paper currency than it has, say, gold and silver reserves on a, on a species standard. And it can really generate as much paper currency as the market is willing to bear, as long as the market has some credence that the bank will pay. And what tends to happen is that the banks overexpand. Uh, they play too many of those cards. And at a certain stage, the market says, no, there's too much money out here in terms of real resources. And you get what's called a bank run. People come back to the banks and will make good on these promises. The banks can't do it. You have recession, depression, what have you. The whole credit structure drops. Now, if that kind of a system were fully disclosed and everyone knew how it was working, my anticipation is that there would be very few fractional reserve banks. The framers of the Constitution were quite aware of the liabilities of bills of credit and fractional reserve banking. And this is why Article I states, no state shall make anything but gold and silver a tender in the payment of debts. And, quote, no state shall emit bills of credit. The Federal Reserve System should be abolished. It was not authorized in the Constitution, therefore we shouldn't have it. But I have to take a sort of a moderate approach to doing it because there's a lot of people who depend on the system today, and I wouldn't close it down in one day, but I would legalize competition, allow gold and silver to circulate as money, take taxes off gold and silver, so you didn't have to pay sales taxes or capital gains taxes, and let the people transition over to gold and silver. Because in 1976, we weren't even allowed to own gold. And then later on, we got the American Gold Eagle. So we're, we're moving in that direction, uh, but we need to go a little bit further to legalize uh, contracts in, in gold. The real culprit is the ability of the Fed to monetize debt. Members of Congress spend money for war and welfare. They can't borrow enough and they can't tax enough, so they literally create treasury bills out of thin air and then the Federal Reserve creates money out of thin airs and buys the Treasury bills, and that has to eventually destroy the value of the dollar. If we were to abolish the Federal Reserve System tomorrow and get the banks out of it completely, turn the entire function as it now operates over to the Treasury, nothing would change. The same people would still dominate the system from behind the scenes. So this question of ownership receives too much attention because where that idea goes is that, well, if we can just find out who owns these banks, and if we don't like who they are, then we can uh, support a move to abolish the Federal Reserve and turn that system over to the Treasury, exactly as it's now operating. So the focus should not be on who owns the banks, but on what the banks are doing. If the public better understood how fiat money can be abused by Congress, it would impeach almost every member and abolish the Federal Reserve Central Bank, as it has done twice in the nation's history. Like the Federal Reserve System, the Congress has been further distorting the letter of its constitutional responsibilities by delegating its power to declare war to another entity, in this case, the President. One of the great problems the country faces is the cowardice of the Congress of the United States as an institution. It has allowed the President to usurp the war-making power where does Congress get authority to delegate the responsibility to declare war to the president? It's not in the Constitution. This delegation sounds more like an evasion of responsibility for political expediency than the original intent of the founders. It has resigned its authority. It is frightened of exercising its authority. It does not want responsibility. It does not want accountability. Article 1, Section 8 clearly states, Congress shall have power to declare war, to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, to provide for calling forth the militia. People such as George Washington, Nathaniel Greene, uh, the leaders of the 
uh, of the army. Didn't think much of the militia. Uh, the militia came for 30, 60, 90, 180 days, and then when their enlistment time ran out, they went home. They didn't have to stay. They came with uh, sort of an oddment of firearms. Uh, typically, they were firearms that didn't entirely fit the army pattern. They had different calibers, logistics problems arose. The men weren't clearly not as well trained as the regular soldiers. Uh, they had a tendency to break uh, when it, the British uh, charged them with bayonets, for instance. So uh, people like Washington, who was obviously very influential at the time, uh, didn't have particularly good word to say about the militia. So one would have thought when the Constitution was drafted, the Founding Fathers would have left the militia out. We don't need this. Hadn't proven to be that effective. Or they might have said, well, Congress or the states can set up a militia if they want to, but it's discretionary. Depends on circumstances. They did the exact opposite. They recognized the existence of what they called the militia of the several states at the time. It's constitutionally recognized. And then the Second Amendment comes along and says it's necessary to the security of the free state. So I would say the Constitution makes it absolutely clear that those entities, because there's not one entity, there should be one in every, every one of the states, is a key structural element of the Constitution. And why? Well, it's because ultimately, who's the militia? It's the people. With every shooting on a college campus, the cultural Marxist indoctrinating mainstream media never mentions the true source of the problem the disintegration of the family unit. Instead, the media pushes the socialist agenda of removing citizens' Second Amendment rights. Let's go to the Second Amendment, which says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Just take the first clause. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Stop right there. That's the only place in the Constitution where the Constitution says that anything is necessary for any reason. The Constitution doesn't say Congress is necessary, the President's necessary, the Supreme Court's necessary. It doesn't even say the states are necessary. It says a well-regulated militia is necessary. To what? To the security. Well, not just any kind of security, but the security of a free state. And that's the sole purpose of the Constitution in toto. The way that the United States was set up originally was that the defense of the nation was to be primarily the responsibility of the states. They were to create militia drawn upon able-bodied American citizens within the state. They were to provide their weapons and their training and their leaders. They were to form into a, into a national fighting force and they would defend the borders of the United States against uh, foreign enemies. But the primary foundation, the element of that was the militia. Never stated in movies like Bowling for Columbine, movies funded by cultural Marxist infiltrated Hollywood studios, is the original intent of the founders that all citizens retain the right to keep and bear arms. More accurately, the obligation to keep and bear arms as part of the militia. The Michigan militia wanted everyone to know that they were nothing like McVeigh and Nichols. This is an American tradition. It's an American responsibility to be armed. I'm sure you guys are the kind of people that people would like to have as their neighbor. As the Constitution tells us, a well-regulated militia is necessary to security a free state. Now, some people may disagree with that. And my response is, well, that's a personal opinion. The law is otherwise. The law tells us that this is the principle on which we're supposed to be operating. You don't like that, amend it. If it's there, enforce it. If you don't enforce it, there will be some consequence because the Constitution is, uh, how should I put this, it's an integrated document in the sense that all of the parts were designed to function with all of the others simultaneously. And if you look at it, there are several pillars to it. There's, of course, the federal government, con the Congress, President, and the Supreme Court. There are the states. There are the people as electors. And then there's this group of entities called the militia. And read the Constitution through, and you'll see they're essentially all on an equal plane. They all fit into this structure. Well, if an architect designs a building with five support columns, it's probably because he believes every one of those is necessary. You knock one of those out or you allow it to decay and you can pretty much expect that that building is not going to be stable over the long term. 
Certain kinds of shocks affect it, it's going to come down. Same thing with a governmental structure. Governmental structure was designed in such a way that the people were supposed to play an important role in maintaining political power of military force. Instead, the Frankfurt School's agenda of injecting cultural pessimism into society continues. Robberies, murder, fires, and now escalating school shootings all contribute to the cultural pessimism and the misguided justification of disarming the citizens. But if citizens ever allow cultural Marxists, such as the Michael Moores of the world, to ban ownership of guns, they will make a grave mistake. These guys that created the American Constitution, the American Republic, were looking into the future and they were concerned about our own government becoming uh, despotic. They could see that. They talked about the possibility of that. How do we prevent that from happening was a major issue of discussion. And they said one of the ways is to make sure that we don't give them a standing army. And the other way is to make sure that the local population was armed. <laughs> because if you've got every man, uh, able-bodied man in the country, and women too, armed and knowing how to use a weapon and under training and with their local uh, uh, squad leaders and so forth, their own commanders, uh, there's no government that's in the United States that's gonna turn against them. So they were very wise. And today, uh, people laugh at that concept, but uh, now that we're losing our liberties, I, I think the laughter is dying down pretty rapidly. By order of the city of Pittsburgh, Chief Police, I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. I order all those assembled to immediately disperse. You must leave the immediate vicinity. If you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code. If you do not disperse, you may be arrested and or subject to other police action. I order all those assembled to immediately disperse. You must leave the immediate vicinity. If you remain in this immediate vicinity, you will be in violation of the Pennsylvania Crimes Code, no matter what your purpose is. Observing thousands of years of history of earlier governments, the founders knew that the only thing that ultimately stands between a tyrannical government and the people are weapons. Uh, quoting Mao Zedong, who in this case agrees with the Second Amendment, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Where the source of political power is to be is where the gun is. Ultimately, that's the bottom line of force in government, right? That's what government is, the application of force. If the application of force is given to some elite group, they're in control. If the application of force is given to the people, they're in control. If you want a free state, a self-governing state where we the people do the ordaining and establishing, who has to control the ultimate body of force? It's the people themselves. And that's not a professional army. That's not a standing army. That's something the Founding Fathers were very much concerned about. They didn't want a standing army. It thought that a standing army was perhaps a, one of the most dangerous things you could imagine because if, if Washington, D.C., they said if they were to have a standing army, you know what they're going to do with it? They're going to use it. They're going to use it for something. If you get a bunch of soldiers sitting around training, you're going to use them. And they didn't want that except in a defensive uh, mode. If people read the Constitution that we, it's not even in a time of war, you have a standing army. When there's no war, it, you have to abolish a standing army within 18 months. You can have a navy but no standing army. Also, never forget the instrument that literally authorized the U.S. Constitution and freed all Americans from oppressive European rule was the Declaration of Independence. This sister document states that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of certain ends, such as the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the duty of the people to alter or abolish it. Alter it means to vote out those who aren't following the Constitution. If such politicians, over time or unbeknownst to the people, reconfigure the government in such a way as to usurp the rights of the people, then the only choice left is to abolish the government. So they were acting within the law when they when they stood on that green and they believed that 
General Gage was outside the law. He was an outlaw, that regular army. And that's why they didn't throw down their arms that day. And the, they opened fire on him. Now, one doesn't like to think of that as being uh, you know, something that we want to face here in this country. But there are many other problems prior to that that the militia would deal with. And a large militia structure would have a terrific deterrent effect on any people in political life that had aspirations to become usurpers or tyrants. It's pretty hard to overcome a country when 60 or 70 percent of the people are organized, armed, and trained. The Second Amendment states that the people, as and through their militia, have the right to keep and bear arms, and this right shall not be infringed. As individuals have rights, and we grant the government privileges. Those privileges are listed in Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. And anytime we have a justifiable reason and the courage to do so, we can revoke those rights and take those privileges away from the government. This means that a well-regulated militia consisting of the people, not some distant bunch of federal professionals, has the right to keep and bear, meaning own and keep on their person, guns and arms, short for armaments. These armaments are for use should the people, through their constitutional militia, find it necessary to abolish a tyrannical and suppressive government and replace it with a serving government that promotes the general welfare and secures the blessings of liberty. Unfortunately, negative influences have crept in. Not only has the cultural pessimism and the parade through the institutions attacked America's culture, but our banking system has been hit as well. The Federal Reserve, set up by banking architect Paul Warburg, is a European-style central bank, complete with all the inherent problems of the old world banking principles diametrically opposed by the founders. Alien concepts such as backing money by debt instead of gold, lending out more money than you have in the vault, printing up money so banks can stimulate the very economy they just crashed. All this so bankers can charge more for interest and snap up real estate assets with straw buyers in recession markets. Thanks to the Fed, Congress can bypass the public's representatives and wage war with money that has been literally created out of thin air. Are any of these American ways? Did the founders set up the Constitution so Antonio Gramsci, a cultural Marxist from the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, and John Maynard Keynes, an economist indoctrinated in the environment of our former enemy, should stamp their war-torn European philosophies into the very soul of our nation? Something isn't right here. In Keynesian economics, they endorse the Federal Reserve System. And to print money out of thin air is, is really fraud because they're stealing from people, stealing the value from some people. So they're completely different. But Keynesianism is not socialism, but it leads to socialism. Socialism is where the government controls supply and demand and prices and the whole work. But Keynesianism allows uh, the market to function to a degree with a lot of intervention, a lot of regulations, a lot of taxes, a lot of planning, and a lot of inflation. How can the original intent of the founders shine through when our entire economic system and cultural institutions have been perverted by ideologies of a world we worked so desperately to get away from? The New Deal, like the Great Society and, and like the universal uh, peace proposals advanced by uh, President Wilson, all of these presidential programs uh, that have expanded the power of government have been the implementation of collectivism in America. Starting at about the time of Woodrow Wilson, 
The country at that point was pretty much uh, an individualistic uh, country. It was based on the principle of, of the individual being supreme and the government being the servant uh, of the people. Starting with World War I, starting with Woodrow Wilson, on down through World War II, down through Vietnam War, now to the War on Terrorism, all these wars are always used to frighten the American people into accepting the expansion of government, supposedly to protect us against an evil, terrible enemy. The actual expansion came about through the Supreme Court adding some words to the Commerce Clause. They said, Congress has the power to regulate commerce or whatever affects commerce. And that's rather a radical departure from the Constitution because imagine if you added that, those words to every other provision of the Constitution, why shouldn't you? If you can add it to one, you can add it to others. You have essentially unlimited government. Well, what that has done is it has given Congress the power to control not only all true commercial activities, but all sorts of things that are entirely local that are related to commercial activity. So for instance, you had the gun-free schools law. Based upon what theory? Well, a gun goes through commerce and eventually ends up in somebody's hands. And there he's within a thousand feet of a school, hundred feet of a school, whatever the distance is. And so Congress can regulate his possession at that point in time. Well, his possession at that point in time is not a commercial transaction by any stretch of the imagination. How can Congress regulate it? Well, because this implement that he's holding in his hand at one time move through commerce. Well, of course, if you follow that theory out, they can control every aspect of your life. How much cornflakes do you eat in the morning? Well, you eat one bowl. Maybe you should only eat half a bowl of cornflakes. Can there be a statue telling you how many cornflakes to eat in the morning? Sure, because where did those cornflakes come from? Well, they came from Battle Creek, Michigan. The Supreme Court has perverted the Constitution, making decisions that used to be made democratically at the local level. The Congress has the power in the Constitution Article 3, Section 2, to circumscribe the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and say, stay out of that area. That is our area, that is the state's area. You are not to get into that. Judges don't decide these issues, people do. After the formation of the Fed and selling the public on the New Deal, it wasn't long before Congress realized it had both the ability and the philosophical justification to print up endless amounts of elastic currency, what we call fiat money. It also wasn't long before Congress realized it needed more and more money in order to service the growing addiction of socialist benefits under Roosevelt's New Deal. The Federal Reserve, when it came in, um, aggravated all the worst problems of the economy. It's aggravated and caused the Great Depression. It's aggravated and caused the last depression. And it'll continue to cause more depression. Before the Federal Reserve, every, every economic system has ups and downs, but they corrected themselves much more quickly and they corrected themselves because people were able, to, had the freedom to uh, shift their attention, to be able to create solutions to the problem and to be able to exercise their God-given wisdom and intelligence to, uh, to be able to do business with each other. Ever wonder why congressmen were so eager to sacrifice tariffs for NAFTA's free trade? It's because tariffs don't amount to much when Congress can print up all the fiat money it wants through the Federal Reserve System. Yes, monetizing endless fiat money was the answer opinion leader economist John Maynard Keynes suggested to Roosevelt in his 1933 open letter. John Maynard Keynes. I lay overwhelming emphasis on the increase of national purchasing power resulting from governmental expenditure, which is financed by loans and is not merely a transfer through taxation from existing incomes. Nothing else counts in comparison with this. By these words, Keynes, the most prominent economist of the time, laid out the philosophic rationale for endless government borrowing and endless government spending of fiat money. Roosevelt bit. And now we're addicted. We're addicted to the, the programs, and the, even the banking system is addicted to ever-increasing the money supply and artificially manipulating interest rates low. 
And on the short run, it does seem to help. Uh, just recently, you know, the Fed pumped in $200 billion in the stock market, loved it. But in time, when everybody knows they created $200 billion of new money, the value of the dollar goes down, which has happened since then. Keynes knew exactly what he was doing. No two men did more to destroy the original intent of the founders and set the groundwork for the cultural Marxism and corporate fascism that was to later flourish as competing totalitarian ideologies, hell-bent on destroying a self-governing republic that sought to practice true free market capitalism. You can go back to a gold standard, say, of a thousand an ounce. But what do you do if they keep spending and spending and borrowing and borrowing? People suddenly realize that these dollars aren't really worth that much gold and they will demand the gold. Sounds to me, given the state of affairs we're in today, well over $10 trillion in debt, immersed in perpetual wars, getting more secular and socialist by the minute, fascist multinationals dominating Congress, that we have allowed serious corruption to seep into the American experiment. We may think we want our independence from Europe, defeated communism and Nazi fascism. But did we? We have traveled the road to totalitarianism almost, almost to the very end. Austrian free market economics is really the answer, and uh, that's the system that uh, we should be following. And more or less, even though it was not known uh, at, the, at the time our country was founded, it was more or less classical uh, economics and classical liberalism that was very close to what the Austrians teach today. Tragic that wine drinking, pot smoking, angle challenged baby boomers would so recklessly thwart the wisdom of the founding fathers by allowing their banking system and economy to be so influenced by European financial philosophies. Philosophies that over the past century have created a living hell of endless wars and empires, as we have seen. The intent of the founders was to establish a nation that was different from the ways of Europe. And they did. The United States is different. Not only that, contrary to the propaganda originated by critical theory, it's the greatest nation that has ever existed. America is not a universal nation or a multicultural nation as CFR globalists writing in foreign affairs would have reality-challenged baby boomers believe. It's a distinct nation, distinct with its own language, laws, history, and cultural background. We are different from the rest of the world. Yes, we even drive on the right side of the road because Europeans drive on the left. So how come the media seems oblivious to all this? The media that's looking out for the folks never discusses fiat currency, cultural Marxism, media consolidation, Keynesian economics, NAFTA, GATT, WTO, or multinational corporations in any sort of critical way? How come the mainstream media downplays people who protest against free trade, the World Trade Organization, or call for protective tariffs? We do a detailed economic study of the box office called our Report to the Entertainment Industry where we get the studio heads to come. And the studio heads have been moving toward more movies with faith and values. Every one of the six major studios have started a division to do movies with faith and values where the most erosion of values and the greatest attack on values is occurring is the independent film market. Independent films, you tend to have a lot of anti-American films, a lot of anti-faith and values, a lot of anti-Christian films, and they do not do well at the box office. Within the television industry, you find a more of an attack on faith and values 
mainly because the television industry is not focused on the vote. You see, in movies, each person votes for their movie. They know that they have to appeal to who's going to vote for them at the box office. You have to separate out the movie industry, which seems to be moving counter to much of the other media. How come the mainstream media acts as an apologist for multinational corporations and fails to take a deep look at the endless expansion of government or its secret partnerships with members of the military-industrial banking complex? Instead, all we see is endless programs threatening the world with U.S. military might. Blonde, aggressive women with plastic breasts and endless TV spots offering insomniacs pills to cure their cheese and dairy product challenged stomachs. Seems to me, to get away with all this cultural Marxist propaganda, the media must be in on the deal. Systematically avoiding certain issues, narrowing the spectrum of speech, redefining words, spinning events, and ignoring, invalidating, and or blackballing any author, filmmaker, or candidate that speaks the truth. Americans and reality-challenged baby boomers need to wake up and smell the Constitution. The famous quote from Franklin was uh, that after he left the Constitution Convention, he says, it's, we've given you a republic if you can keep it, and uh, obviously we haven't done a very good job. I think if people want to live in a democracy or a republic such as ours, then they're more than free to do so, and we should lead by example, not by force. Citizens need to get familiar with the original intent of the founders and realize that the forces of cultural Marxism have been raping and pillaging the United States for decades. But to realize the dream and keep this magnificent republic alive, all Americans need to do is take three steps. One, disconnect from all sources of cultural Marxist propaganda, media, and lifestyles. Two, don't patronize the largest Fed member banks and fascist multinational corporations. Three, connect up with the original intent of the founders and get active applying the U.S. Constitution. Americans and history-challenged baby boomers should understand what it means to be a self-governing nation. They need to understand the Constitution from a philosophical point of view, not just a mechanical point of view. Why were certain things emphasized and others not? Why is a well-regulated militia necessary to the security of a free state? Why is the term general welfare the only term that appears twice? What principles lay behind the Constitution and why. If citizens better understood these things, they would be able to go about their lives with a greater appreciation of the rare opportunity they have been given to live in the American experiment. Instead of pessimism, they would have the realization that America has just begun, that the future will be even more incredible than anyone imagined. Take three steps and it will happen. Yes, the cultural Marxists in the media and the universities will scream and dramatize. Yes, there will be a percentage of religious fanatics that attack the United States or hate us because we flourish and prosper. And yes, there will always be secular robots and iconoclasts that hate traditional values and deny America was populated by Christians or influenced by biblical principles. But the founders somehow knew all this, for they had studied thousands of years of history and countless failed civilizations. From these lessons, they built the Constitution of the United States, and this document has succeeded as no other.
the blueprint for the longest standing republic in history is in your hands. Eventually, even the cultural Marxists, the corporate fascists, the Islamic terrorists, and our current special interest dominated Congress will see the light and become part of the general welfare. In the meantime, don't give liberty challenged members of society the power to enslave us all just because a relative few have so little faith in the original intent of the Founders and the United States Constitution. The Constitution of the United States represents no threat whatsoever to our form of government. <laughs>